Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird, Wacky and Wonderful Stories podcast with your hosts, Shelley and Bella. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 95 of the Weird, Wacky and Wonderful Stories podcast. Hi everybody. We have got an interesting show coming up for you today. We've got a returning guest with us. He's going to be along a little bit later on. We've also got a voicemail that we wanted to play you as well from someone who has gone to our website and did exactly what we asked on the last show, which is if you stop by, leave us a voicemail because we'll play it on the show. And I don't know, encourage other people to do it as well. It'd be great, wouldn't it? We only want the good ones, though. Well, I'm going to filter out, you know, if we <laughs> if we did get any bad ones, they wouldn't, it, they wouldn't no, see the light really of day. No, that's not really fair, though, is it? I don't care. It's our <laughs> show. We're going to play the good ones and the good ones only. Okay. If you leave nasty messages, then... Too bad. So here is the voicemail that we've received and take a listen to this. Hi guys, this is Shazzy. Um, I tried recording this before, so hopefully you won't get more than one recording. But anyways, um, I just want to come on here and I was looking through your website yesterday and today and I just want to tell you that it looks phenomenal. I know you said it was a labor of dot, dot, dot love, but um, it really came together nicely and I just want to let you guys know that. And also, um, your latest episode with Mr. Black, I thought was really great. I, I had never heard of any kind of theory like that before, especially with rings around the earth and just the, the paleoarchaeology. It was very interesting. It was very original. And I just wanted to give you guys kudos. And also, I wanted to thank you so much again for um, having the intro for Shazzle Rocks. It really means a lot. And I really appreciate you guys. And I love you so much. And I just want you to know that. So anyways, I hope you're having a great day. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shazzy, for that. That is absolutely amazing. Thank you very much for stopping by and for giving us your feedback. That was awesome. Definitely. And thank you for my Christmas present and my free Christmas present and all that. Yeah. Yeah, because Shazzle rocks. Yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on with the show, because today we're happy to have with us a returning guest, as I said earlier. He's a British man now living in Japan. He came on the show last time to talk about his series of books called Hidden Paths. Walk in Kyoto was the one that we focused on. This time, however, he's going to give us a sneak preview into his new book, Paranormal Kansai. Please welcome to the show, author and historian, Philip Jackson. Hi, Philip. How you like my oop at the end? <laughs> Yeah, well, people aren't going to understand hi, that now. Hi, no. Shelley, hi, Bella. <laughs> yeah, for the, for just so that our listeners understand what's gone on, we've had some trials and tribulations this morning, wouldn't you say, Philip, with the sound and they're trying to get the technology working for us? Yeah, uh, technology hasn't really been our friend uh, today. <laughs> yeah, as all of those conspiracy theorists out there would say that it's because we're talking about the unexplained and the paranormal, so uh, mm. we're being oh, jumped yeah. on by all the bad spirits. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Welcome back, Philip. Again, obviously, we spoke to you last time about your series of books, Hidden Paths. Walking Kyoto was the one we looked at last time. And just going forward now, you've brought out another book, which obviously we're going to be talking about later on. But for those people who haven't heard of you before and didn't listen to your last episode with us, can you give us a little bit of a background about you and how you ended up in Japan? Sure, yeah. I'm originally from Lincolnshire in England. And I first came to Japan in 1998. Um, my wife is Japanese. After we were married, we came to Japan a few times, visit family. And then we came to live here in 2003, up until 2007, then went back to the UK. And we came back to Japan in 2012. And I've been here since, since then. I haven't even been back for a holiday. So I've been here nine years consecutive in Kyoto. And just touching on the paranormal side of things how did i get into that the background on that basically paranormal history folklore 
supernatural unexplained i've i've been interested in that ever since i was a child i've got a brother who's a couple of years older than me one of my earliest memories is a book that we used to share which was the uh, i think it was called the the usborn book of specters and hauntings uh, which had all, all the famous stories like Borley Rectory and, and all those places in. So we, we were quite fascinated. And being in Japan and living here and getting to know uh, Kyoto, the city where I, where I live, the city is over a thousand years old. So there's just so much history. Um, and I think I mentioned when, when we spoke this time last year, when you've got that amount of history, you only have to do a little bit of digging before you come across some some of that history that has, you know, a, a connection to the paranormal or, or the folklore tales, which has some kind of cryptozoology element. Um, it, it, it's all in there, really. Do you think that going forward, actually, the number of paranormal stories which do the rounds, you know, within families and that sort of stuff, are going to wane? Are going to diminish? Because if we go back sort of a hundred years. People would be sitting around with their family, chatting about things that had gone on, talking about folklore and tales and everything. And I suppose with the advent of Netflix and all of the other things that we do instead now of sitting around as a family, do you think that we'll lose those those kind of stories unless people like yourself are, are putting them in books? I, I don't think we'll lose them. I can see your point 100%. And in Japanese history, there's there's a great history of, of telling stories. There's a story a story of a set of stories, 100 stories. And it's it's there's a rumor that it was a initiation a sort of ceremony for many young samurai where they would sit around and, and tell these 100 stories and they would have all these lights candles or oil lamps around them and every time one of them told a story they would blow out one of the candles or put out one of the oil lamps and behind that is the fact that what they would say is that once all the lights had gone out that it would summon some kind of evil spirit so there's a history of telling stories and i think it's just a case of how those stories are told is maybe going to change in you know then they had people sitting around telling stories nowadays we've got podcasts where people tell stories so uh, i think the technology is in some ways making it easier to tell a story yeah that's what i was kind of thinking because like you'll get there's loads more video evidence of things and even the tv shows i mean some of them are crap admittedly but mm -hmm. Whereas before, you would read a story and you would get the picture in your head. Now, though, you can just look and see stuff. But but I think it's yeah, lost some yeah. of the intimacy is, I think, where I'm coming from, that people used to sit around and tell the stories and they would form folklore. Now, are they sitting around saying, do you see that TV program? And so it does, isn't as... Mm. There isn't that kind of yeah, legend yeah, behind it, if yeah. you see what I mean. Also as, also as well, that you know, as, as technology gets better... It makes it easier to fake a story with the imagery. Yeah, that's true. You know, with computer graphics, it's very difficult to know what's a real image nowadays and, and what what is a, a fake image. Well, your book this time is Paranormal Kansai. Am I saying Kansai correct? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. And is that an area of Japan? Yeah, it's an area, sort of central west. Tokyo is in the uh, east of Japan. And Kansai takes in seven, seven counties, seven prefectures, which is Osaka, Hyogo, Kyoto, Nara, Wakayama, Mia, and Shiga. And Osaka is sort of the, the biggest city in the area. So it's a very well-known and very popular area of Japan because you've got Osaka and you've got Kobe and you've got uh, Kyoto. So you've got you know business areas. Also, you've got tourist areas as well. So tell the truth. How long did it take you to be able to say all of these Japanese places like they just roll off your tongue? <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's not easy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll ever get it perfectly uh to be honest with you i'm still still make a hundred errors every day <laughs> that's okay we just have to let everybody know that right before we started recording this we had a pronunciation meeting <laughs> and <laughs> you're giving away all our trade secrets well you know hey <laughs> and, and <laughs> yeah there's some real tongue twisters uh, uh in there it's really difficult sometimes <laughs> well there was a part of the book that i could pronounce and that was introduction and yeah. uh, in that, you, you explain, actually, that it's not only important to understand the dictionary definition of paranormal, in quotes, but also it's the differences 
in, I guess, the perceived culture of Japan as well. So can you explain a little bit about those cultural differences and maybe the different categories that are given to different events, different paranormal events? Sure, yeah. I mean, this is something that we talked about uh, when we spoke last year, the differences between paranormal ghost stories unexplained in Japan as opposed to to the UK. And at the time, we, we was talking about programs like Most Haunted, which mm. we don't really have here. There are people that that go around, you know, with their groups of friends and, and they'll put videos on YouTube of haunted places that they visited in the same way as, as the UK. But the, the overall feeling is, is quite different. And some of, some of that is, is connected to religion. One of the big religions here is Shinto. And one of the beliefs of Shinto is to do with the soul to, to the point where even inanimate objects over time will will develop a soul which is why you get stories of dolls which have you know their hair continues to grow and, and things very like that. freaky story uh, sorry i said that was a very freaky story yeah as, as mentioned in the book there's a shrine called awashima shrine in kansai it's nicknamed the doll shrine because people take dolls that they don't want to throw away that they believe may have a, a soul and uh, the shrine will take care of them or dispose of them in a what they would call a appropriate manner they have a doll there which they don't have it on display but they claim to have at the site where its hair grows probably the most famous story of one of these dolls is in hokkaido which is in the north of japan the north island and that's at a place called manenji temple and in 1918 there was a young japanese man his name was uh, akichi suzuki and he bought this this doll for his, his younger sister, and his younger sister was called Okiku. So these kind of dolls have taken on the name. They're, they're kind of nicknamed the Okiku dolls. So he bought it for his sister. Sadly, the, the, the girl, Okiku, she died uh, a year later. And so they, they put the doll into a, a small family shrine. Lots of houses in Japan have a, a small shrine where you, you pray to past relatives and usually have photographs of the past relatives and, and leave an offering every day. So the doll was placed there. But what was strange is that the family, they, they began to notice the hair was getting longer. And everyone in the family, they started having having dreams about the doll. I mean, this was, would have been terrifying, but they would wake up the next morning and the doll was by their bed. Uh, and they started oh, to have lights going on, off in that. <laughs> I mean, that would be absolutely terrifying, wasn't it? You you put the doll in the shrine that night and you wake up and it's it's standing by your bed but they were having lights going on and off banging noises almost like a, a poltergeist and then they started hearing voices and it would get stronger and stronger the closer it got to the girl's birthday and eventually they had to move the family had to move ha house not because of the doll they became quite quite attached to it really because they they connected it to the the, the lost daughter but they gave the doll to the shrine because they couldn't get rid of it yeah the shrine took care of it and apparently they still they still have it what, what's interesting about that story as well that particular shrine manenji temple in hokkaido they did a test of the hair and it did prove that it was actually human hair wow to a certain degree i i can i can rationalize yeah. the fact that a spirit may have entered it because a spirit is you know non-physical could get inside the, mm -hmm. the doll i can deal with that what I can't deal with then is that this then grows human hair with DNA and everything else that I struggle with. Yeah, there's not really any explanation that uh, behind. Yeah, you know, I mean the only the only explanation that you could come up with from a, a sort of skeptical point of view would be that it, it's a fake. You know. But well, I, I, mean, I think it's pretty creepy though. Well, no, 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 absolutely creepy. <laughs> I mean, even if you t if you take the hair element out, the fact that there's possibly their daughter is now inhabiting this doll, and this doll is well, they're waking up in the middle of the night and stood next to the side of their bed. I mean, you said that they were very attached to it. What? The, it was around their yeah. throat. I mean, that's the kind no. of thing that would. <laughs> No. <laughs> no, you know what I mean though, don't you? You know, well, you're talking like a yeah. little chucky doll. <laughs> that's what that's what I'm in, that's what I'm picturing. Obviously it's not. No. <laughs> to them it was it was um, almost like a reincarnation of the daughter. Yeah. But uh, just the spirit was there within within the doll. At the shrine, Awashima shrine, what's being reported there also is that people visiting the shrine uh, claim to have heard children's laughter as they're walking around. So there is a line of thinking that if these dolls belong to children that have passed away, then maybe the spirit of that child is is still within that doll. But it's, yeah, it's a very strange thing to get your head around, really. I used to have this little doll. It was like a porcelain doll. 
And um, yeah. Yeah. it was a couple of friends and me, and we grew up together, so we just did such stupid things. So we decided after watching some horror movie that we were going to try to have a seance or whatever. And so we had a Ouija board, and, and we took this doll, and we laid it on the table. And so this was one where if it was laying down, its eyes were closed. If you sat it up, the eyes would open. I and my mother had exactly the same kind yeah. of doll. So she was laying on the on the table, and her eyes were closed. And I was like, if you are old, your eyes will open. And the eyes on the doll just popped open. Well, you never saw three kids go running as fast as we did that <laughs> night. Cause I think I would as well. <laughs> so, so that story, to me, is really, really creepy. We've watched things before, haven't we? And there's been dolls on there where their eyes open and close and that. And you freak out every time still to right. this day. Right. I'm not watching that anymore. <laughs> We kind of hear of things like reincarnation into another body, but, but not reincarnation into, a... into an yeah. inanimate object is kind of interesting. I wonder whether that's kind of a choice that the spirit would make. And I know we're just speculating now whether that's a choice the spirit would make, mm -hmm. or whether it kind of gets trapped in that, or whatever. It's interesting to to kind of wonder how that happens. You hear stories, don't you, of, of mediums who uh, you know they go into a place and 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 they say you know I I can I can sense the spirit here and that this spirit is is trapped here and they they need help to get to the other side. Could well be something like that, uh, as you say, where it's trapped within the doll. Or maybe someone like Bella, for instance, was doing a seance and said, you know, <laughs> if you're here, make the doll's <laughs> eyes move, and, and you trapped a spirit inside that doll, maybe. Well, I don't know, but I didn't have her for very long after that. I can imagine. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. at this shrine that you're talking about, do they just kind of look after the dolls, or, or is there some kind of, like, ceremony where they would sort of, like, you know, bury them or whatever, or or read them last rites, or try and sort I of... I think you can go in and see them. There's reputed to be about 20,000 dolls there. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they do do specific ceremonies, but I, I'm, I'm not sure whether they dispose of any or not. I think it's more people who have them, and there's some, you know, whether it's a sentimental value, or whether they have had a similar experience to the doll, the Okiku doll in, in Hokkaido, and they don't know what to do with it, they don't want to keep it, and, you know, giving it to the shrine is is uh respect to them the the only option they have yeah respect mm. i think a lot of it is mm -hmm. respect um, i think that's one thing we spoke about last year when talking about you know the, the paranormal side of things here there is a lot of uh respect for the you know for the spirit world well there was another story in your book which has totally freaked me out it's senichimai department store i don't know if you can tell the listeners about that but that was just the the amount yeah. of stuff in that was just crazy. It's a very chilling story, and it, it's it's a story that when you put all the pieces together, it covers you know about four hundred years. Basically, nineteen seventy two, thirteenth of May, nineteen seventy two. There was a fire in the Senichimai department store in Osaka, and the building. It wasn't just a department store; there was also nightclubs in the upper floors. And there was one particular club which in the building which was which was very popular. It was called the Playtown Cabaret Club. And at the time when the fire started at 10.30 at night, it, it was packed. Now, I thought that the fire may have started from a dropped match or a cigarette that wasn't put out properly. There was some construction work going on in the building. There was lots of materials, sort of chemicals and, and, and paints and materials that were left. And, and it's thought that maybe a, a cigarette or a match had been dropped into into some of the materials and that started the fire but basically yeah the, the nightclub uh, was packed people were trapped inside they started to panic so obviously there was a rush to get out people were crushed um, some people died in the crush as they were trying to get out 24 people tried to jump out the windows out of those 24 22 of those died and some people also died from carbon monoxide poisoning as i said there was there was construction materials in the building so the fumes from those that were burning came into the club and 20 people died also when they got into an emergency escape chute to get out of the building and that collapsed as well and it was about three days before the fire department could finally get the fire out the safety in the building the fire doors had been locked emergency shutters didn't function the elevators weren't working the building didn't have a proper fire sprinkler it was just you know it was just a nightmare but once they had got the fire out completely and they'd accounted for all the all the the people that had died in the disaster 
118 people had died. And so the building was demolished. Some years later, it became a, another department store uh, called Printemps. I, I think uh, it was a, a French company, Printemps. And then they later, some years later, became Bic Camera, which is a, a Japanese electronic store. And it, it's still that today. But after the Printemps department store opened, that's when sort of stories ghostly stories started to come up. A lot of staff, they wore prayer beads as they started to have experiences in the building. There was one story that there was a, a, a late night sale. In Japanese department stores, if you want to, if you buy something for a present for somebody, they'll always ask you, do you want it wrapped? And you take it to a counter and they give you a number and, and you know, you wait for your turn while they wrap it for you. So there was this corner on one floor where they was doing gift wrapping and a woman's voice was heard shouting, fire, fire. And it was at the same time as the fire happened back in 1972. But this was years later. It was almost as if one of the, you know, if there if there was ghosts in the building of, of people who had perished, maybe it was replaying that 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 encounter. Yeah. And it was reported that downstairs in the basement there was an area where uh, staff could go to smoke, and the people that went down there to smoke, they always claimed that they felt sort of a, a heavy feeling pushing on them on their shoulders and some people started to think well you know maybe this is the unhappy feelings of the, of the spirits of the, of the people that died because it may well have been a, a smoking accident that caught it and now there's people in the building downstairs smoking some people in the neighborhood around the building claim to have heard like thuds thudding noises in the night which they claimed it sounds like people hitting the ground but obviously mm. there's nobody there when it's checked so yeah. again could that be replaying the events of the people that did jump out of the building uh, and died uh, out in the street. One of the most chilling parts of it is that in the elevator, when, when it was reopened years later as, a, as another department store, the elevator staff started claiming to hear the strange sounds mixed in with the music in the elevator as they were going up and down. So the company contacted the uh, the company that provided the, the music for the elevator and they collected the the tapes and took them back to the studio and they couldn't they couldn't hear anything so they took them back to the elevator now when they played them in the elevator they could hear these strange sounds which when they when they checked a, a bit more it was a distinct crying of of women so they made new tapes gave the new tapes to the to the department store they put them in and the same sound was coming up again they took the tapes out, listened to them in the recording studio where they'd made them. The sound wasn't there. I've tried looking into it. I can't find what, how, whether they'd managed to actually resolve the issue or not. But definitely that was two sets of recordings where the same thing was happening. And underneath where the department store is, there's underground lines. And some of the commuters have reported hearing muffled cries for help. You've also got on the streets around the area taxi drivers picking up customers from from out you know senichimai late at night uh but when they reach the destination they look around and there's there's nobody there mm. one group of female workers they reported seeing this apparition of a, a kimono clad club hostess disappear through a wall there are these kind of host and hostess clubs in in japan where uh, you may well have heard about them seen them on tv where people can go and you have male hosts and, and female hosts. And basically, uh, if you're a man, you can, you pay a lot of money to have a, a you know, a, a pretty girl pouring your drinks and telling you how fantastic you are all evening, uh, and vice versa with male hosts. And uh, I must say, I've never had the experience of going to one of these places, so this is all second-hand information for me. In a lot of these bars, the, the manageress of these places, they usually wear a kimono. It's a sort of like a, a sign of status that they're, they're the manager of, of the establishment. So there would have been some of these bars inside the building when the, when the fire happened. So it could well be somebody who died on that night. But going back, taking the story 400 years, in 1615, there was the Battle of Osaka Castle. Now, after the Battle of Osaka Castle, there were thousands of bodies, and they had to be buried somewhere. And they buried them in different locations throughout Osaka. And one of the places was where the department store was in that area. It then later became an execution ground during what's called the uh, Tokugawa era, from the 1600s up to the late 1800s. But this is where it's really, really quite chilling. 
the number of people that died in the fire was 118. The number of people that were executed between the 1600s and the, the, the late 1800s was 118. Mm, wow. When I read that at the end, I literally mm. got a chill because yeah, there's just so many questions. You know, yes, okay, mm. it, there could be coincidence, but there are just so many questions yeah. there that, that make you wonder, you know, whether there's some mm. other kind mm. of history repeating itself type situation. Well, I know yeah, one thing. Yeah. I would lose loads of weight because I would never get on the elevator. And if I ever did want to have a cigarette, I certainly <laughs> wouldn't do it in there. That elevator that, thing was 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 yeah, really interesting that, as well. Yeah, I'd be that taking they the took steps. The tapes away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're, they're actually taking the tapes away, and the only times the sound of the women screaming were on that tape was when yeah. they were playing in the elevator. I wonder if they actually, when they took the tapes, did they actually listen to them and hear it themselves? Or were they going, oh, these people just want new tapes or something? No, no, they took it back to the studio right, okay. where they were recorded and listened to them several times and could not detect any other sound. But when they were in the elevator, they could. even the engineers could hear it. Wow. The only time, yeah, the only time they could hear it was when it was yeah, in the elevator. I had planned in the past year going to the, the department store and seeing what it's like because it, it yeah it's I say it's called Bic Camera which is a popular department store for electrical goods in Japan but basically because of the covid situations um I've been able to I haven't I haven't been able to get around uh, at all much in the past year but but this year I'm hoping that I can just get out there and uh because uh, I mean, it's in the center of Osaka City. There are so many ghost stories where they're on a back road or in the mountains or, you know, a, a, an abandoned building somewhere that nobody goes to. But this is, you know, slap bang in the center of the city. It's a very busy area, not too far from Osaka Castle. So it has lots of tourists in the area as well. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a very chilling tale. Mm, that is freaky. Well, you were talking about, obviously, you weren't able to go there because of COVID. One of the places you might want to go once COVID is up is to the beach. But I don't know whether you'll be going to Nakagawara Beach. Oh, that, that was pretty good pronunciation. Was Nakagawara it? Nakagawara Beach. Oh, thank yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, Nakagawara Beach. <laughs> Nakagawara Beach, that's in the prefecture Mie. This is a story that goes back to 1955. It's probably just as chilling as, as you know, the Senichimai execution grounds and department stores story. And with both of these stories, I think what's tragic about them both is that both of them includes fatalities. People died in the incidents. They both have a connection to something that happened in the past that, that caused deaths in, in a more recent terms. Whereas, you know, with the Senichimai, you've got a connection between possibly the ba the battle of osaka castle in 1615 and it being an execution ground and and lots of death on that place which had that connection 118 and as well with nakagawa beach and in this case it was it was school children basically what happened there was a middle school they were having their swimming practice and it wasn't anything unusual they they had about a, there was about 100 students and teachers all together and they left for shore, they went out into the water. And there was a, a designated area where they would regularly check to make sure it was okay. You, you know, they would check the weather, they would check the, 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 the tides, the times of the tides. Where they used to swim, it was only about a meter deep. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't deep, but it was deep enough that they could have a practice swimming it. You know, they checked the weather before they went out there. Uh, there was no problems with that. As I say, this was in 1955, but not long after the class got out into the water, then one of the teachers noticed this, this white line that was coming across across uh, from the ocean towards them. And they just presumed it was like a shallow wave, but it disappeared before it got to them, before it reached where they were. Straight after that, some of the children and adults, they started to struggle in the water and they were they were finding it difficult to stay, even though it was only a metre deep. People on the beach saw that they were struggling in the water. So they sent out people to, to res rescue them. But by the time they'd, they'd got out there, some of them had already sadly drowned. And those that they could pull back to the beach, they were sort of like a catatonic state. They couldn't really couldn't really function. Uh, it was almost as if their legs weren't working. But very strangely, one of the swimmers, she was clutching this white hat, but none of the none of the children, none of the instructors were were wearing white hats. And also, some of the children that they did get out, they died later when they got to hospital. Uh, and altogether, thirty six people died in the incident. There was a few 
sort of thoughts put forward to what could have happened. There'd been a typhoon a week earlier, and they thought maybe it could have caused fresh water, salt water layers in the area to give different tides, which could have sort of confused the swimmers. But that was kind of ruled out. It, it, it wasn't seen as a likely enough reason to be possible. The idea of a sudden wave, and it was mentioned that this white line had been seen. Um, but again, there wasn't really a lot of evidence to prove it. It went through court cases, and after the court case, they, all they could put it down to was just a, a, an unsolved tragedy. But then a few years later, a witness came forward, and the witness was actually one of the survivors. And she said that after they'd, they'd swam out to the area where they were going to take their practice, and there was no problems, and then one of her friends pointed out what she thought was a line of people dressed in white headgear that were coming towards them, which is probably which some reports said was this this white line coming across the ocean, which they thought was a, a shallow wave. After they'd seen that, this line of heads then disappeared under the water, and then people started to panic because they, they said their legs were being grabbed by hands under the water uh, and being pulled down by force. And the witness actually said that as she was being pulled and she was struggling, she saw this white face, totally expressionless, looking up at her from the water. But obviously, you know, her stories were kind of, you know, ridiculed, not taken seriously. But apparently, I can't find other reports, but it, I have read that other witnesses did come forward to corroborate what she was saying. But this is where, it, you know, it becomes really chilling and, and it, it, it's got similarities to Senichi Mai in, in the historical side of it and a backstory that's led up to this. But in World War II, about two and a half thousand people were killed by air raids in the area. And because of the number of corpses, they just didn't have anywhere to bury everybody. And so lots of the dead were buried at sea instead of traditional ceremonies. What's quite chilling is that the last day of air raids was July the 28th, 1945. And the date of the incident on Nakagawa Beach was July 28th 1955 so this mm. swimming tragedy actually happened 10 years to the day of the last air raid and to add to that the headgear that the girl was actually holding was said to be an air raid protection headgear which a lot of the soldiers japanese soldiers would have been wearing when they were killed in the air raids which obviously leads to ideas put forward that maybe if it was spirits in the water they were maybe spirits of the dead that were killed in the air raids that yeah. came to an end on July 28, 1945. And they were coming back July 28, 1955 to, um, I don't know, take take some more with them. Creepy. But it's, yeah, it's quite a chilling story. It is, especially when you consider, obviously, it's children. Yeah, yeah. That always makes it harder to swallow. Yeah. When I was looking into sort of some of the stories for, for this book, Paranormal Kansai, there's so many suicide stories. The book could have been twice as long. I just got tired of reading stories where, you know, there is a spirit here. Of, it's, it's thought to be the spirit of a, of a person who jumped from the top of this waterfall or jumped from this bridge and committed suicide. And it's the same. I think, you know, you get the same sort of sad feeling when you're reading about a suicide or or children that uh, have been killed. You you don't really want to read it. You know, you don't want to hear about it. And, you you know, you feel sort of, you, you feel sad reading, reading it back and, and thinking about it. It's terrible. The picture on the front of the book, it looks like a bamboo forest. Mm. Is that the forest where it's reported that a lot of people commit suicide? No, it's not. Picture on the cover is actually the bamboo forest that goes up a mountain called Mount Oiwa, where there's an abandoned shrine. When you get to the other side of the mountain, that's where you come to the location where the samurai Akechi Mitsuhide was killed. And his ghost is supposed to be heard screaming in the bamboo forest. Yeah, we spoke about we spoke about him last time, didn't we? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I have actually found more connections to that story since. Do you want to share that with us? Or are we going to leave that for the listeners to read in your book? Yeah, I can put that on. I mean, it's it's a tunnel. I mean, that's an, another thing that, that you come across so much in, in Japan, tunnel. I was joking with somebody recently, you know, in, in England, it's see that pub over there, it's haunted. In Japan, it's see that tunnel over there, it's haunted. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I was writing the questions, I actually, I've got a dual monitor thing going on on my computer. So mm. on my left-hand monitor, I had Word open where I was writing the questions and the research that I'd done through reading your material. Mm. And I'd seen, obviously, there was a lot of things to do with tunnels. So 
I had been scrolling through the PDF of the book that you sent on my right-hand screen and thought, oh, yeah, tunnels, and gone to the left-hand screen, was working on Word. When I wrote the story about tunnels, I then looked to the right and found that it was on. it had stopped on this random scroll. It had stopped right with the heading of the Ayama tunnel, right, <laughs> right. right in front of me. And I just thought, okay, got to ask him about that one. <laughs> Well, the Aoyama tunnel, that's that's in Mia, the same prefecture as the um, the beach story we just went over. With that one, that's on a route, Route 165, which connects Osaka, Kyoto, and Mia prefectures. And that's, yeah, that's a strange one. You, there's lots of claims of engine breakdowns around the tunnel entrance, uh, and people have reported shadowy figures running across the tunnel, running towards cars, people hitting these ghostly apparitions, but... You know they don't feel anything when they when they hit. This is a bit of a freak one. Some drivers have reported they put the window down, they put the hand out of the window, and when they pull it back, there's strands of thick black hair around their wrapped around their fingers. Oh my God. Um, I mean, can you imagine? You imagine that you're driving along and suddenly you, you you decide to get a bit of fresh air as you're in a stuffy tunnel and you bring your hand back in and you've you've got black hair wrapped around your fingers. Um, but there's also a there's also a green telephone box, a, a telephone kiosk on the west side of the tunnel. And it's reported that some people have seen a, a woman and child standing with heads bowed by the box. And if you stop by the telephone box, they will come and get into your car. And also the phone apparently rings uh, late at night. And if you pick up the phone, uh, you hear the voice of a man who said that he's trying to connect from the spirit world, but there's not really any stories to give any background as to you know who this woman and child could be, who who this voice could be. So where these stories come from, it, it's difficult to say. You know whether it's just a urban legend or whether people have genuinely experienced that. But these sort of reoccurring stories in tunnels are all, all across Japan. I mean, just going back to the connection to. Uh, Akechi Mitsuhide, who, as you say, we spoke about last year. And, you know, I'd really recommend anybody listening to the episode that we recorded last year to get the the long story of Akechi Mitsuhide and how he was killed. But, but yeah, he he was killed at, in a bamboo forest in Ogorisu, which is not far from where I am now, which is close to the, the bamboo forest on the cover of the book. And it's said that at night you can hear the screams of his ghost in the bamboo forest as he's impaled on a bamboo spear. There's a location in Kyoto where his head was buried, but there's a tunnel called Kazan Tunnel. And there's lots of cemeteries around that area now, old cemeteries. It was an execution ground. And it's claimed that Akechi Mitsuhide, after, after he was killed, one of his retainers called Saito Toshimitsu, he took the body of Akechi Mitsuhide and he buried it. At, the, at one of the cemeteries around the Kazan Tunnel area. And now there are reports of people seeing this samurai figure around that area. So, you know, people put two and two together. Well, you know, Akechimitsu Hede, he was buried here. We've seen the ghost of a samurai. So suddenly you get the stories of the, you mm-hmm. know, the ghost of Akechimitsu Hede is, is around this area. But also it was an execution ground from 1603 to 1868. So there was a lot of burials there, a lot of possibilities of who that samurai could be. even. Saito Toshimitsu, who who took Akechimitsu Hideo's body there to bury, he was executed not far from there, and then he was buried there as well. So you could say, well, is it his body? Mm. Um, but also next to it, there's a, another tunnel next to it, a newer tunnel called the Higashi Tunnel. Kazan Tunnel is just for walking and bicycles, but Higashi Tunnel in, I think it was 1994, there was a, a moped or a motorcycle accident. And there's been a report now of a ghost of a, a headless scooter moped rider going through the Higashi Tunnel, which people say is possibly the ghost of the young man that was killed in 1994. Um, but just so so many tunnels. Quite interestingly, there's a there's another podcast in in Japan. It's called Ishikawa Summit to See. It's it's a Brit and an American like yourselves who do the podcast, and they have all kinds of subjects. And uh, I spoke spoke with them, and when we were speaking, I I found some information about a haunted tunnel near near their area called Ushikubi Tunnel, and they actually set out. They went out in their car afterwards, and they, and they went to. Uh, try and uh, have a look inside Ushikubi Tunnel. There's, there's stories that a murder was committed in there and, and the murderer committed suicide. Then the murderer's mother went looking for her son and she committed suicide and the three spirits are in the tunnel and a car driving through there saw, saw this funeral procession coming through the tunnel and at the back of the funeral procession, it was a an old-style procession, non-modern-day funeral. There was a, a, a woman carrying 
uh, a samurai's head in her hands and so they sped up and the woman started chasing them down the tunnel and it didn't give up chase until they were out the tunnel but yeah these these two guys who, who do the ishikawa summer to see podcast they drove out there joe and casey and they, they actually put a video on their youtube channel of of their expedition out there but unfortunately because of the weather in that area there's been lots of heavy snow so they got about i think they got about two kilometers in car to the tunnel and the snow just absolutely blocked the road so they got out and they walked a little bit but eventually they never made it to the the tunnel because the snow was just so heavy but it, <laughs> it's a shame it would have been interesting to see how they fed yeah definitely that, that would have been awesome i wonder if there was something trying to keep them at bay there's a part of me that you know is you, you do hear so many stories of engine failures in you know kind mm. of reoccurring incidents and so there's a part of me that thinks well you know i'm, I'm I'm kind of glad they didn't make it. And, uh, you know, could that, you know, that, that heavy snow that stopped them from getting there, is that a, you know, a, 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 a stroke of luck for them? Yeah. There's a part of me, and I'm sure they'll appreciate it when they listen to this, there's a part of me that I would have enjoyed hearing that they'd been chased down the tunnel by the woman carrying the samurai's <laughs> head. <after. laughs> Yeah, that's not yeah. very nice. <laughs> yeah, not really something you want to sort of wish on someone, is it? No, but I'd have been calling them. No, going, no, no. Did you see it? Yeah, Did you yeah. see it? <laughs> yeah, no, that's amazing. Well, definitely shout out to Joe and Casey then if they're going to listen to this, and we'll definitely take a listen to theirs as well. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, Philip. We really appreciate you spending your time with us today. We've been speaking about your book, Paranormal Kansai, Mysteries and Unexplained Stories of West Japan. Where can our listeners get hold of that? Well, it's available in download, Kindle, ebook, or paperback from all regions of Amazon. There is the website, www.hiddenpasskyoto.com. And there are some links on there to all the Hidden Paths books. Uh, the Hidden Paths books is just walking guides around Kyoto, uh, around the countryside, around the city. There are four books and then there's an om- omnibus edition. And basically the Paranormal Kansai book came about because a lot of paranormal stories started coming from the historical stories. So I put them all into one. But yeah, it's all on, on Amazon. There is a YouTube channel, Hidden Paths Walking Historical Kyoto, and there's a few videos of, of locations on there as well. And in terms of our listeners, if they want to get in touch with you, where can they do that? Uh, if they go to the website, again, www.hiddenpathskyoto.com, there's a contact section. Uh, they can send me a message that will come direct through to me. And yeah, I'll be able to pick up any messages from there. And, you know, if anybody's got any questions about the books or any questions about Japan, you know, feel free to uh, to drop me a message brilliant thank you very much really appreciate your time with us today uh, thanks for having me again it's, it's been a pleasure all the best take care philip bye thanks take care bye bye really enjoyed that chat with philip we tend to hear a lot of stories don't we from the uk or from america and basically western countries it's so nice to hear about these eastern cultures and the stories that happen there Yeah, we don't usually hear much about anything over there, do we? No, the thing is, is that they obviously speak a different language to us. So having a Brit over there who speaks the two languages and is able to interpret those stories from over there to here, I think is fantastic. And his book is really good as well. And what we didn't mention during the show or during the interview was that Philip did actually send us a copy of his book. So we will be sending this out to one lucky listener and all you need to do to win this, same as always, is to retweet or share on Facebook or Instagram or any social media platform that you use. Share this episode of the show so that it can give him a little bit more exposure and also point people towards our show as well. We will pick one lucky person at random and then get in touch with you and get an address etc to send it. Lastly, don't forget to head along to our website, www.weirdwackywonderful.co.uk and leave a message like Shazzy did at the start. That would be absolutely amazing. Until next time, please remember to stay weird, Weird, wacky wacky and and wonderful. wonderful. Bye.